Gary Beatty uh, and uh, Lone Oak Baptist Church and the, uh, I can't remember the name of that camp, but that the keyboard that we have, we don't have a keyboard, and uh, so I was calling around to find out, you know, where we can get one, because I really wanted to have the music, and I, I don't want to use that can music anymore, although it's sufficient, it's just not as good as having Sister Beverly play, and uh, as uh, Damon will attest along with me that sometimes those tracks or that music are <laughs> a little off of the way we usually sing the songs and so that makes it a little more difficult and so I want to thank Sister Beverly for playing for us this morning and uh, and uh, Brother Damon for leading the music uh, I will tell you I, I'm blessed already uh, I hope you are being able to be here and see everybody and the even though it's hot, I'm sweating right now. That's okay. I can take a shower later. Uh, I hope you don't mind me wearing tennis shoes this morning. Uh, <laughs> I, I felt like, well, I'm not going to dress up in a suit, so I'm going to put tennis shoes on. Wear those. Uh, be more comfortable. But anyway, they're getting soaking wet, and, and so they'll have to dry out this week. But anyway, uh, I want to thank Brother Kerry and that camp. That's that's their keyboard for that camp that they use. Uh, and uh, I called him, he said, yeah, we've got one, and he brought that to me. Uh, and of course he told me, he said, now the only thing wrong with it is up in the upper range of the keys, there's one uh, key that when you hit it, bang, it's just a bang. And of course, uh, Sister Beverly's found that a few times. Yeah, <laughs> it is there, so now we know that. But anyway, wanted to thank them for that. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, just, uh, I was, was uh, Sister Dale told me just a few minutes ago, that uh, my telephone number is also, I didn't think about that, all those papers we handed out to you. So you have my cell phone number on there. But anyway, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I invite you to the book of Judges chapter 3. Judges chapter 3 this morning, since uh, we're through uh, the Easter Sundays, we can get back to uh, what we've been doing. We've been uh, looking at all the judges. And uh, so... We're still in Judges chapter 3. We're just going to look at one passage of scriptures from one verse at the very end of Judges chapter 3, and that's verse 31. Remember last time we were here, uh, we were looking at uh, the, the Ehud, who was one of the judges, and uh, that took up quite a few verses. Well, this next judge, really, there's just one verse. Now, I just want to warn you guys, Jason's going to be walking around, and uh, he's going to be... Uh, Get some video of folks here, so hopefully you brushed your hair at least. Uh, and he's got to kind of incorporate all that together when he uploads this online. So maybe the folks that said, nah, I'm not going to go that early in the morning and be a part of that if we continue to do this, maybe they'll get so excited about it they'll come next time again. And uh, so uh, uh, he'll be walking around getting video of folks. So don't worry about that. Just ignore him. You just watch me and you listen along. Judges chapter 3, verse. 31. We've got a real long text here this morning. You ready? And after him was Shamgar, the son of Adath, which slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. Let's pray. Father, we come to you once again. Thank you for this day. Thank you for an opportunity once again to worship together. And we just thank you, Lord, that you made it possible for us to be able to continue to come together at our regular times in one capacity or another. Pray that you bless this time we have together. Bless each heart that's here. May we be attentive to your word and apply it to our hearts and our lives today. And Lord, I pray that many others will see it when it gets posted online uh, here later on this morning. And uh, we just pray you bless this time that we have together. We're, it, it saddens us that we can't just get out of our cars and go hug necks and shake hands. But Lord, help us to uh, uh, just be obedient and try to keep things to where we can continue to do the things that we're doing. Bless this time we have together. Bless the Word. Bless our hearts as we listen to it. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, what we're going to talk about here this morning is, uh, you know, because uh, we got a real long text, so, uh, you know, this is interesting to uh, try to find some points and a point to go along with this one passage of Scripture. But what we're going to talk about here this morning, when we talk about this Judge Shamgar, is we're going to look at the tools that he used for success in, in this work that he did. And, and you know, when I got to thinking about this and preparing this message, uh, it, it, it dawned on me that we're in the midst of this very 
uh, situation right now. Ever since this virus came into the picture and things uh, started getting limited and, uh, as to you know us coming together and, and we started doing things online and things like that. Uh, so uh, it, it's changed the whole landscape of the way we have church and the way we act as a church. And I'll tell you, church, that's not a bad thing, okay? I don't want you to... Uh, now, the virus is a bad thing, obviously. I understand that. It's it's causing havoc. We know people that it has made severely ill. By the way, uh, I uh, text uh, Brother Danny Jones yesterday, asked him if there was any update, as uh, many of you probably saw that uh, he had... Uh, I, I shared with you that he had sent me a text saying that he and Rachel, the day before, that was Friday, were going back to get retested uh, for the virus and then also get some chest x-rays done. Well, I hadn't heard anything back from him on that, so I texted him yesterday, and he responded, and he said they don't have, they probably get results on all that Monday, but he said Rachel is doing much worse, and she's still at home. But it just, uh, she's having a lot of problems. Uh, she's having a lot of chest pain with the breathing. Uh, they're both still running fevers, uh, and she's just miserable. She's in a lot of pain. They put her on a nebulizer, which he said seems to help with it. So we need to continue to pray for that family. As far as I know, the girls uh, are all better, and they're doing fine. Uh, but Brother Danny and Sister Rachel are still struggling with this. He's, he said he's still running a fever, but he does feel better, okay? As far as I know, and I may be wrong about this, and watching the way this virus has affected other people, uh, I haven't seen anything indicating that even when a person gets the virus that it lasts as long as it's lasted with them. They're going on four weeks now with this uh, and having severe problems and high fevers for four weeks. So we need to remember them in our prayers, especially Sister Rachel, uh, in our prayers, okay? So I just want to share that with you. But being put in the situation that you and I are in today uh, is interesting. And it causes us... Uh, it, it is a stressor. And, and here's what we can do. Here's what I want you to understand from this message this morning. When stress comes into our life, we can either fold up and shut down. Amen? Or we can stand up and we can push against it and work our way through it. And when I was preparing this message, I got to thinking about that. That's exactly what we've been doing. And I don't say that as a, as a, in, in, in a position of pride. But even though we've been hampered in our services, we've continued to look and find a way and work out a way that we could somehow come together and we could worship together. And I want you to know, that's not just me. You might say, well, boy, preacher, we're really proud of you and you doing all this and getting it set up and, and getting us all together like you have, and I thank you for that. But that's about you too, because in this pressure, you could have just folded up and and sat down and said, you know what, I, I just can't do that. And, and, but you haven't. You've been there. When we're online, you're there. I see you. I know that you're there with me. And uh, and, and so I, I like to think that, that we've already implemented some of this message uh, in our lives here lately. And so maybe that will help you a little bit this morning as we consider uh, these tools for success that we see in the ministry and the work of this judge called Shamgar. Now, one, one uh, 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 theologian or commentator, excuse me, uh, in writing about the book of Judges, he gave a synopsis of this when he spoke about Shamgar. He says this, his brief notoriety in the Bible lends itself to three success secrets. And that's what we're going to talk about here this morning. What are these three success secrets that we see in the life and the ministry of this judge Shamgar. And I'm going to tell you, there, when you hear it, you're going to say, duh, I should have known that. I mean, yeah, that's right. And so let me share it with you real quickly here this morning. Number one, start where you are. When you come into a situation and something needs to be done, stand up and start where you are. Number two, use what you have. Uh, you know, and I'm just giving you in a nutshell right now, but when it, when it comes to these situations, we, we can't worry about what we don't have. We have to understand and know what we do have, the resources that God has given us, and then we need to just work with that. Amen? Number three, okay, do what you can. God doesn't expect us to do any more 
than what we can. Amen? Amen. If you, you know, I, I, I was trying to think this morning of a way to get people to say amen because I can't hear you in your car. So if you want to say amen, just flash your lights or beep, beep, get a little beep on the horn, okay? It won't bother me a bit. Uh, I'll take that as an amen. <laughs> But anyway, those are the three points we're going to talk about here this morning. But I want us to consider first the background of this situation. Now, when we look in the book of Judges, we see Israel in a time of their life where they should have been advancing, amen? They should have been moving forward, uh, you know, and, and enjoying the pleasures and the comforts of the promised land. That's what God, he said, I'm going to lead you to a land uh, with milk and honey, and I'm going to help you possess the land. I'm going to drive the enemy out before you if you'll be obedient to me. But instead, what we find is that Israel, because they weren't always obedient to God, and because they tended to want to act out uh, and to take on the attributes of those heathen people that were around them that they didn't run off like they should have, we see that they find themselves constantly in a state of failure. And so, the last time we were here, in several of the verses here in this chapter, we looked at the judge Ehud. And you remember Ehud, he was the left-handed Benjamite who took a dagger and he shoved it into the, the belly of Eglon, who was the king of the Moabites at that time, and he killed him, and then he led the Benjamites in victory uh, over the Moabites. And because of that, uh, the Bible tells us, before we get to this, and we looked at this last time we were here, that the peace that they had with the Moabites uh, lasted for 80 years. But here's the issue. Now we get to verse 31, obviously there's still a problem because here's the situation. Israel had more than just one enemy. The Moabites were not their only enemy. They had more. In fact, what we see here in this verse is that they had the Philistines. Wouldn't it be nice, folks, if in our lives we only had one problem at a time to solve? Amen, Rick? Would you say that? You know, if, if, if I only had one problem to solve, uh, you know, each day of my life, I could, I could probably handle that. Okay, I just uh, each day solve one problem, and and there we go. But that's, you know, that's the issue in life is that we're hardly ever in a situation where we only have one problem at a time, and that's the case here with Israel. Uh, they didn't have just one enemy; they had many enemies, and of course, uh, these uh, Philistines were a fierce enemy. They would frequently invade uh, different areas of Israel, and uh, when they, of course, they were like pirates. They would come in and they would invade and they would plunder uh, the Israelites and take everything that they had, uh, and they were keeping them in check as best as they can. In fact, if you if you looked over in Judges chapter 5, you don't have to do that again if you like, verse 6, the Bible tells us a little bit more about these times that Shamgar was living in. It tells us about the lack of public safety uh, it went with these Philistines raiding Israel and coming in and doing the things that they were doing. And it basically tells us that in, in Shamgar's days that the roads, the main roads that most people would normally use were abandoned and instead when people needed to travel they were taking the winding paths out through the, the uh, what would be called the, the, the unpopulated areas because they didn't want to be found. Uh, apparently the Philistines they were marauders and and, and they were bandits, and they would, if you were taking the normal roads, well, they would bring you down and they'd take everything you had and probably kill you. Uh, verse 7 says that in the villages of Israel, it's, it's kind of like we're going through today, I mean, there's just, uh, it, they were empty. There was no business, no commerce going on. And when we look at verse 8, there in chapter 5, it tells us that amongst the Israelites, there was not a shield or a spear found among 40,000 of the Israelites. They Literally, the Philistines would come in, and one of the things they would do is when they took over the village, they would take all their weaponry away. Why? Because then the next time they come in to take food from them, well, then they had no way to defend themselves, and the Philistines have all the weapons, so it's going to be easier for them. And so this is what was going on uh, there during the time of Shamgar. But, but thank God, then enters Shamgar, this, this, this fellow that's going to take care of the, the situation. And in these desperate circumstances, we see that it motivated Shamgar, this one man, to remedy the situation. The Bible simply describes for us here, verse 31, it doesn't say a whole lot about Shamgar. It just tells us this about his heroism when it says that, 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 that he struck down uh, 600 Philistines with an ox goat. Now, how many of you know what an ox goat is? 
for those of you that don't, let me explain it to you. Uh, I'm not a farmer, so I just read this, but I'm going to tell you what I read. An ox goat was a, basically a stick is what it was. Ox goat was a stick anywhere from 6 foot long to 10 foot long. On one end of that stick, there would be a point, okay? And, uh, and so that point was used, uh, you know, back in those days, they used oxen to do the work to... Uh, Till up the ground so that uh, uh, you, you know so they could plant their seeds and they could grow things and so uh, they use oxen to pull the plows. Well, oxen don't like to pull plows. I don't know if y'all realize that. That they don't when they stick them on the plow, they don't say, "Wow, great, we can pull the plow today." No, they don't like doing that. All oxen like to do is to stand around and eat. That's what they like to do. They don't want to do labor. And so the ox go the pointed end of that ox go. Uh, was used to poke them in the back of their legs to kind of coax them, if you will, to, to, to move forward, okay, to keep going forward. On the other end of that would be a spade, okay, and that spade would be used whenever the patent plow got a lot of mud or clay uh, that gathered up on the plow. It doesn't work as well. You farmers know what I'm talking about. And so they would use that spade to get off the the, the, the thick clay and mud and the roots off the plow so that they could plow a lot easier. But the point I'm trying to make here is this is a farmer's tool. Okay? However, in the hands of a man that's motivated, this farmer's tool became a mighty weapon, and with it he defended not only his family, he defended his countrymen, he defended his property against the invading marauders that uh, that came into his area, and he did that with a farm instrument. And I want us to understand uh, what was, you know, these, these different points of success that we see in Shamgar and how he was able to accomplish this. Number one, start where you are. Well, that's exactly what Shamgar did. He, you know, said, well, what, well how did he prepare? Well, he just started, amen? He, he was there, and this was going on, and Shamgar, all we know is he started. Uh, you know, uh, he was, he was, he, this was his starting point this time. He was living in a time and a place when his life and his property and the lives and property of his family and his countrymen were at the mercy of the Philistines who were thieves and thugs and marauders. Uh, and so he could have seen himself as being helpless, probably like most of the people of Israel felt. He could have seen himself as helpless. He could have seen himself as as being hopeless, and, and he could have just buckled down and folded down and, and, and just kind of melted down under a bush somewhere and not did anything. Uh, but instead, he didn't do that. He started where he was at. Now, uh, even the most hopeful, okay, the most hopeful people can sometimes be trampled down under a weight of worry and fear caused by the stress that comes to the problems of life. That, that, that's one of the many reasons why, folks, we need God. Amen? This is why we need God. Now, the uh, uh, the communists, I was trying to think of their, their name, the communists used to say, only weak people need God. Only weak people need God. And in our culture today, the... Uh, uh, the intellectualists would say the same thing, only weak people need God. But the truth is, we're all weak. Amen? We're all weak, and so we all need God. Here's a God, and, and, and or here's a judge, and as we study these judges, we're going to find this is the case with every one of them, that uh, because of their dedication to God and their willingness to be used, God placed His Spirit on each of them, and by His Spirit and their weakness, He leads them. Uh, beginning from a place of weakness, I want you to understand, is not always a bad thing. It can actually be a good thing because when we begin in a place of weakness, then it becomes a God thing. Amen? When God comes in and He charges us up and gets us ready to go. God does things in the lives of people who will admit that they need Him that He cannot do in the lives of people that will not admit them. God can do things in your life when you recognize your weakness and say, God, I need you to use me and fill me. God will use you then. But if you come and say, boy, I got this handled, well, then you know what God's going to say? All right, you go ahead and handle it. <laughs> Let's see how that works. Amen? So we need to learn to rely on God in these situations. So three times in the Bible we find these words, 
God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. We find this in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 24. Uh, we find it in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5. James chapter 4 and verse 6 is where we find this said in Scripture over and over again. You see, what I want you to understand though is you need to start where you're at. Shamgar didn't wait until he, he had an army of a thousand to lead into battle. Uh, and you don't have to wait until you have, think you have all the things you need to move forward and do what God would have you to do. Just, my friend, just start where you are. Start where you are. Secondly, use what you have. Use what you have. Shamgar didn't have a sword. He didn't have a spear. But listen, he didn't need one. Amen? We don't need a lot of the things that we think that we need in order to serve God, in order to have victory in our lives. You know, you may say, well, I don't, preacher, I don't, I don't have the money. If I only had more money, I could do more stuff. Uh, if I had a better education, I could do more stuff. You know, some of the most successful people I've met in life throughout my years, uh, uh, men who have... Uh, you know, who loved the Lord and served God and men who, who went out and, and started businesses and were great successes and, and they were a blessing to other people in their life. And, and this is not the case every time, but there's been many of those people in my, in my life that I've met who didn't even graduate high school. Y'all probably know people like that. You know, they're from your generation now, uh, or maybe they passed on. But they, 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 they did great things in their life and were a great success. And they didn't have a, a, a college education. I'm not against having a college education. Don't get me wrong. But uh, uh, if you get those things, if you can get better equipped, then please get better equipped. But the thing is, is you need to use what you have. Don't wait until you get better equipped to serve God. Take what you got right now and serve Him with that. That's what we need to do. Okay? Shamgar didn't have a sword of spirit, but he didn't need it. God came to Moses. Remember Moses? In Exodus chapter 3, God came to Moses in the burning bush. He said, Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt and I want you to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And Moses started backing up and making excuses. He said, well, who am I? He said, I, I, don't, I, I don't have the talents. I don't have the ability. To, I don't have what I need to do that, Lord. So God told Moses, he says, what do you got in your hand? He said, well, i got a shepherd's staff. He said, that'll do. God said, cast it on the ground. Moses cast it on the ground and turned into a serpent. God said, grab it by the tail and pick it up. Moses grabbed it by the tail and picked it up. And it became a, a shepherd's staff again. And you might say, well, a shepherd's staff is not a, a great thing. Uh, but in, in the hands of God, it was a mighty instrument. In fact, it was by that shepherd's staff that the, the Nile River was turned into blood and most of the plagues were brought upon Egypt. It was by that shepherd's staff that the Red Sea was parted so the people of Israel could cross on dry ground. Amen? I mean, and wandering through the wilderness, that shepherd's staff was used to do some great and mighty things in the hand of God. Okay? You need to ask yourself this question. What is it that you already have that you could use to succeed. What has God already given you that can be used for success? You see, sometimes the only thing a person has is an idea. Amen? I mean, God puts ideas in our mind. You ever had that happen, Brother Allen? God put an idea in your mind? I know you have. God put an idea in your mind. That's all you have. We, we, as Christians, we call those visions. Amen? We get a vision. And if God gives you a vision, my friend, act upon it. Don't say, well, I, I don't know where to start, God. I don't know what to start where you're at. God, I don't have anything to do that with. Just use what you have, amen? Just use what's in your... God's already, if He's given you the vision, He's already given you what you need to accomplish what needs to be done. David used to sling, and he took down Goliath, amen, with a sling and a stone. Uh, in Elijah's days, the, the widow woman... Okay, the widow woman and her son, she just had a she had a little bit of meal in one barrel and she had a little bit of oil in another barrel, but throughout three and a half years of famine, God blessed that that she was able to feed herself, her son, and Elijah during that time. Okay? Uh, uh, the little boy, 
who was found when Jesus fed the 5,000. What did he have? He had five loaves and two fishes. And, and 5,000 men plus their families were fed because of that. My friend, start where you are and then use what you have. That's what God's saying. That's what Shamgar did. And God made him a success. And number three, just do what you can. Do you know that God doesn't expect you to do any more than what you can? That's all He expects of you and me, is to do what we can. Defending Himself against 600 Philistines with an ox goat definitely elevates Shamgar to a status of being a champion. Amen? And it doesn't really matter whether he killed all 600 at one time or whether this was at different times. All that matters is that Shamgar did what he could. He let God use him and he accomplished what God wanted him to accomplish. How often do we fail to make a contribution because we believe that our contributions won't really matter. Won't really make a difference. In, in, in our lives and in the lives of others. But yet Jesus taught us this. Jesus said, if you give someone a cup of water in my name, then what you've done is significant and it matters. Listen, my friend, you may feel unworthy. I'm going to tell you, we all are. We're unworthy. We are broken vessels in the hand of a mighty God. And I'll tell you, if God's going to do anything in this world, He's going to have to use unworthy people because that's all there is. And that's all He does. He takes unworthy people and He uses us, He blesses us, and, 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 he, and He uses us for His glory. And I'll tell you this, God is not looking for people, uh, for worthy people that He can bless. God's looking for available people. That's what He's looking for. As a pastor, when it comes to our church ministries, I can tell you because that's God's vision and that's God's way, that's all I'm looking for. I'm not looking for somebody to teach a Sunday school class that's got a, a college degree in education or been a Sunday school teacher for a hundred years so they're very knowledgeable on how to do that. I'm going to tell you, God's not looking for that. God's just looking for people who are available that will allow themselves to be used by Him for His glory. You say, well, preacher, I'm not very impressive. I can't do impressive things. You know, and, 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 and I can try, but it just won't be as good as what somebody else can do. You know, I'm going to tell you something, friend. You may not ever get your, head, your name in the headlights, Okay? You may never achieve your 15 minutes of faith by serving God, but if you'll do what you can, God will bless what you do, and it will make a difference. What can one person do? What can you do? Judges chapter 3, there's, there's only one verse about this man, Shamgar. Let me ask you this morning. Was, was he significant? I will tell you, for his family, for his countrymen, for God. It was very significant what he did. God included him as an example for you and me to follow in our lives. To endeavor to say, you know what, God, I want you to use me. I want you to do something with me. And so listen, here's what I'm going to do, God. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to put my faith in you. I'm going to work through all the issues and the stresses in my life and be used by you, God, because I'm just going to start where I'm at. I'm going to use what I have. I'm going to do what I can. Every one of us find ourselves in that kind of situation right now, don't we? Darby, you know what I'm talking about? As a teacher, I mean, one day they called her up and, guess what, you're a brand new teacher. You're just now learning how to do this. Now you've got to learn something totally different. Now she's having to teach her kids online. And you know, they're talking about all the stresses of that from families at home and systems shut down. I'm sure the teachers are experiencing the same problem. And now the governor's come on and said, guess what? 
This is the way the rest of the school year is going to be like. Because we're not going to bring them back to school. You know, we find ourselves as a church in this situation. We say, well, man, we, we, just, we just got hog tied. How can we reach people? How can we be used by God in this situation? Because we can't come together in our little church building and have our worship services. How's anybody going to visit us and come to know Jesus as their Savior? I'll tell you, friend, that was never the only way that God intended for people to get saved. Never. This is not a, a hospital for lost people. This is the training grounds for the saved. That's what this is. Okay? So we can't use the building, but we're still in training, aren't we? We're still having services. So take what's being shared and use it in your life, and more importantly, share it with others. Too many people today are, you know, are, are just busy sharing whatever. We're all online. In fact, I was on Facebook. They probably got people uh, running around like a one-legged woman in the high, high house restaurant waitress. You know, they, they don't know how to keep up with what's going on. Everybody's online and everybody's on Facebook. And, what do they call them other things? Twig or I don't know what they call them. Anyway, it's all kind of online services people are using to try to stay in connection with each other. All the churches are using. Be a blessing to somebody on there. I'm encouraged when I see somebody post something. Uh, Sister Sally made a simple post. This has been a few weeks ago and I reposted it because all it was was just a little post of one, two, three, four, five gave steps to how a person gets saved. Folks, that's witnessing online. Amen? That's how we share the gospel online. We make posts and tell everybody Jesus is the answer. You need to accept Jesus as your personal Savior. Put any posts on there about how Jesus has blessed your life. This, this means something. I was looking at an article yesterday, and I won't close with this. I get emails from uh, a group called Answer in, Answers in Genesis. They're the ones that have the uh, Ark and the uh, Creation Museum up there in Kentucky. And they put out emails answering uh, pertinent questions of the day. So the question, and this has been, the question has been posed to me. Is God trying to speak to the people of the world through the coronavirus? Is God telling us something? Well, my friend, I'm here to tell you, and this has been my answer, and I'm glad when I read their answer, went right along with what I've been saying. Of course he is. Because everything that God allows in our lives, even especially the stresses that come in our life. You know, God, the Bible says He will not allow you to be tempted above that ye are able. Okay? So God never allows anything to come into our life that He doesn't know we can handle it with His help. And when God allows situations like this to come into our lives, I guarantee you He's talking to us. He's, he, he's trying to teach us something through this. And, and, and every one of us is different things that God's teaching us. But here's the main thing that they put on the earth that of course, God, in every situation, God is talking to us. And if anything, God's saying right now, He's saying the same great old message that has always been the truth, that salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And that men in the world that are not saved need to realize that in their lost condition, if they leave this life, if anything the coronavirus teaches us, it teaches us once again about our, our weaknesses as human beings and that death is always knocking at our door and that we can be gone at any moment. And if we leave this life without Jesus Christ, we are without hope. My friend that might be watching us online and maybe you're not saved, if you don't put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and I don't care whether it's coronavirus or a semi-truck or a heart attack or a stroke or whatever it might be, if you don't put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you are without hope. But I want you to know Jesus loves you. And He wants to save you. All you got to do is put your faith and trust in Him. Call on Him to be your personal Savior. And if you'll do that, friend, we know that. I think pretty much everybody I'm looking at here has done that. Put their trust in Jesus Christ. But i got to say this, because we might have folks that will watch this later online that 
have never heard the gospel message. That all of sin comes short of the glory of God. And the wages of our sin is death. And that word death is not just talking about that we will physically die someday, but that it's talking about eternal separation from God in a place the Bible calls it. The wages of our sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But if we just put our faith and trust in Him and what He did for us on the cross of Calvary, we can have a home in heaven. Folks, that's what people need to know at a time like this. That there is hope. And even in this weak, feeble life that we live, the trials and troubles come along and people are dying. There's hope. And that hope is found in Jesus. I hope that all of us here are putting our trust and our hope in Jesus. Not in the fact that things are going to go back to normal someday. I want them to just as much as you do. But whether they do or whether they don't, I'm going to tell you our, our hope is still in Jesus Christ. And we're only sojourners in this life as children of God. We have a home in heaven. That the glories of that place could never be matched by the troubles and the trials of this life. So put your faith in God. Put your trust in God. Say, God, help me to start where I'm at. Help me to use what I have. And help me to do what I can because that's all I can do and that's all you ask me to do. Normally we would have an invitation at this time. What I want you to do is we're just going to bow our heads. We can't have you getting out, walking around each other. Might get caught. No, I want to keep you safe. But I want you to bow your heads with me this morning. We're just going to close in a word of prayer. And don't just rush off. I'd like to come around and speak to every one of you for just a minute and say hello. I'll tell you what, after we have that prayer, somebody asked me if we could do this. I, I don't think it would be a problem just for a second. If you if you want to step out of your car, but stage your car, don't, don't leave it. Step out of your car, look around, wave, and say hi to somebody maybe you couldn't see from inside your car. You're welcome to do that. Um, if you need to get out and do something else, um, let's just keep our distance. Let's make sure we stay six foot apart, okay? Let's have a word of prayer together, and then uh, we'll close the service this morning. Our fathers, we come to you today. We want to thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for this time we've had together to worship you. I thank you for each one who has turned away from the cares of uh, their home and, and uh, things that uh, they could be doing there to come out this early and be with us for this service. I pray that you bless each one. Use it for your glory. And I pray that uh, somebody will hear this message online and they'll put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ before it's too late. We love you, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen.